All right, so the MPEP 500 review, um, this is just going to go over the receipt and handling of mail and papers, and then just like a couple of different areas that require fees and what kind of discounts are offered there. Um, so beginning with filing by fax, really the thing about filing by fax is it's okay, except when it's not. So the papers which cannot be filed by fax would be patent applications, certified documents, color drawings, and color drawings, that's kind of an easy one to remember because when you're going to file a fax, they're not going to come through in color when you would need them to. So of course that wouldn't be helpful, but for black and white um, drawings, you can submit those via fax. A uh, request for re-examination, international applications, disciplinary proceedings, <clears throat> interference, and interference actually can't even be filed by mail. For those ones, you have to hand deliver them. A secrecy order, again, I think that one's kind of obvious because if it's under a secrecy order, you don't want it coming through via fax when just anybody is going to be able to see it, depending on the area. Um, so for these ones, I think the best places to look for answers for them would be MPEP 502.01, CFR 1.6, and 1.8, and that'll talk about a lot of the different mailing and fax procedures there. So the fax and EFS systems are controlled by the Eastern time zone. So if you've done any sort of old exams or looked at any of those questions, there's always that one um, asking uh, what you do if it's if you're on the West Coast and it's already past midnight on the East Coast. Well, in that case, you take it to a post office and hope that they, they can do express mail that late, depending on what kind of post office would be open that late. But remembering that the EFS system and the fax are both controlled by the Eastern time zone is a really important one. So when there are those ones that are talking about time, kind of paying attention to what time zone everything's in. The certificate of transmission, which you send with fax, um, that's available for foreign countries. While the certificate, that should be an M, certificate of mailing is not available for foreign countries. So that's a good distinction too. I've seen that in some example um, exam questions, just that the transmission available for foreign countries, mailing not for, or not for foreign countries. So that, and then going further into the certificate of mail and transmission, the certificate of mail privilege is being able to get the benefit of a mailing date rather than the receipt date in almost all cases. And so when it is not available would be new patent applications similar to the certificate of transmission, including continuations, continuation in part, division, and CPA. Uh, papers and interference, as we said before, has to be filed by hand. Agreement settling and interference. Any PCT papers, which, you know, kind of goes along with the new application, but also you can't be filing anything with the PCT with it. Um, and then what to do if neither of these are available, you can do the express mail to addressee and not a post office to post, express mail post office to post office. If you do post office to post office, they're not going to use the date in date it'll be the date that is given to that document will be whenever it's received at the pto so definitely not the best situation if you were really needing to get a filing date in um so then the items with a certificate of transmission benefit are a notice of appeal only for filing and so this is or not only for filing. So this is something that's just kind of interesting. So you can use a certificate of benefit for filing, but the due dates for the appeal brief are still calculated from the receipt at the PTO. So if your notice of appeal was sent via certificate of transmission or certificate of mailing um, on the... Um, Yeah, um, so for certificate of mailing and certificate of transmission, both of those will provide the benefit for notice of appeal to receive the filing date of whenever it was in at the post office. So the, um, but the, the appeal brief, let's say that um, it wasn't received at the PTO until June 4th, but it was received at the post office June 1st, then the due dates for the appeal brief are still calculated from the receipt at the PTO. So the appeal brief would be due two months from June 4th, kind of in that case. So then it, amendments can also um, be under the fax benefit. So for signature requirements for correspondence, uh, it's going to be handwritten, the S signature where there's the slashes like that. 
an EFS character coded signature. Um, and so, and, and so there, there's also the wet signature that of course is allowed, right? So if you just sign with a black pen, um, but you're not really going to be doing that for most of the documents. It's going to be these signatures are the typical ones. Then for an incomplete application, there's a couple different procedures and rules for that. So in order to receive a reference filing date, that's going to be a, spe a specification only, which is required under the PT PLTIA. So that's um, something that transitioned in 2012, I believe, 2012 or 2013. And so the specification only is required for non-provisional, not including design. Um, the applicant would then receive a notice of missing parts for the filing fee, the oath and declaration, the claims, the signed ADS, if there's any drawings that are needed, plus a surcharge will be required for the late submission of the required items. To receive a fixed filing date, right? So that's gonna be a filing date that is not gonna change really in reference to um, any of those additional items. Because if you are adding if you're adding claims to your specification, it's possible that will end up adding new matter accidentally. And so you might end up moving your filing date. So that's why it's called a reference filing date. You could edit your claims so that you maintain that original filing date, but kind of good to remember, it would be best to just file all of that at once so you can get just a fixed filing date. And so that would be a specification, at least one claim, any required drawings. And then at that point, an applicant would still receive a notice of missing parts for the filing fee, both their declaration plus a surcharge for late. So then um, kind of going along with that, if any of the filing fee, author declaration claims, if any of that is missing from that original file, then you can't necessarily file a CPA, a continuation, a division or continuation in parts because those aren't going to be those aren't going to be accepted until the parent application is considered complete. So then as far as what you can do without paying a fee, I think these are all good ones to kind of be aware of, but probably not expected to memorize this whole list, just know where to find it within the MPEB 500. So a, filing a protest, a petition to make special for illness or age, um, to access issued, published, and certain abandoned files, kind of like what we talked about in MPEP 100. A uh, timely response to the official action or restriction requirement. Timely filing an IDS, so that would be within the first three months or before an office action. Uh, conducting an interview, obtaining a certificate of correction for a patent office mistake. If it's a mistake that you made, like perfecting priority or anything like that, then you would have to pay a fee in that case. Um, filing a supplemental declaration or amendment. So if you are have already filed an amendment and need to file another amendment following up, fixing something or adding something in, in the reply, there's no fee for that, which is great. A petition require requesting withdrawal of incorrect holding of abandonment. So that's saying that the PTO messed up somewhere, they didn't receive a document, something like that. Again, anything that's pretty much a patent office mistake, that one is going to be um, a lot, that one's going to be free typically, which is nice to remember. Um, and then filing comments responding to a notice of allowance, which is a very interesting area that I believe is in the MPEP 1300, filing comments responding to a notice of allowance. So I'm good to know that you can do that for free. Um, filing a citation of prior art. And if I'm remembering right, um, that's only for the first submission. For further submissions of citation of prior art, you do have to pay. I'm pretty sure on that, but we'll talk about it a little bit later. Um, really though, rule of thumb, most things do require a fee. And so if a question is asking and you don't have time to look it up, I think the best bet is going with the one that does require a fee in that case. Um, so for deposit accounts, and this can pr um, protect you in a lot of ways having a deposit account, you can use to pay fees and avoid consequences such as abandonment. So if you include some sort of authorization within amendments or within your original application to charge whatever fees are necessary to deposit account XXX, then that way they'll always charge fees to that account rather than letting something go abandoned. However, if that account does not have sufficient fees to cover it, then you will be also charged a surcharge in addition to um, the fee that you are already going to be charged. So making sure that, that deposit account is fully, um, fully funded is important there. The authorization to charge the deposit account has to be signed. There's a lot of questions that can include um, kind of uh, tricky wording to figure out 
what does need to be signed, what doesn't need to be signed, but charging a deposit account has to be signed. So for the calculation of filing fees, and I think these are just good ones to remember, uh, there's a filing or a fee for filing, search, and examination, uh, independent claims in excess of three, total claims in excess of 20. So kind of a good one to remember here is if you have a case that has three independent claims and with 20 claims in total, and you add one depend one independent claim to that, you have to make sure that you're calculating both the fee for the excess of three and the fee for excess of 20 and not adding multiple, not overcomplicating it, but making sure that you don't miss any of those fees. Multiple dependent claims, um, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but basically that one, if it's dependent, if it's claim three and it's dependent on claim one and two, it's going to get charged twice for that claim. The specs and drawings over 100 pages and beyond 100 pages, it goes up 50 um, in 50 page increments. Uh, late fee for filing oath or declaration or filing fee. Um, and so then if you are making a single payment covering multiple fees, then you have to have that payment itemized. And so if you're paying on EFS, there's um, a little section on there where you itemize each fee that you're paying. If you're, you know, trying to pay for all of the, these filing fees at once or something like that. So for small entity status, um, again, this is, I think, a very easy area to get tripped up, especially when um, small entity factors are mixed in or small entity answer options are mixed in with special circumstances options. So like someone who is old and also poor, you know, you kind of got to make sure that you're reading the question correctly as far as if it's asking about an application which is made in special or the calculation of a fee. So that's going to, so a small entity is 50% off of most fees with the exceptions being document supply fees, certificate of correction fees, miscellaneous fees and charges, and the rule given for that is 1.21. Um, and statutory disclaimers, they used to be um, discounted until March 19th, 2013. Now they are not discounted. And as far as who qualifies, there is the independent of inventor. So that's an inventor who has not assigned or licensed their invention to a large corporation. And notice it also says all inventors, because if one of the inventors goes through the um, assigning to a large corporation, then the entire application loses that small entity benefit, kind of for obvious reasons there. A small business, that's mean less than 500 employees, including part-time. So that's another kind of area that can be tripped up if they're, you know, a temporary employee or a contractor or anyway, they still count as an employee. And then a nonprofit. So Good to remember those ones. Um, licensing to the federal government does not preclude from small entity status. That's an important one to remember. And then to assert status, you used to have, a, have to have a petition and go through a request and everything. But now if you just pay the small entity fee, that is treated as a request for small entity as an assertion for it. Um, and refunds are available, but the question is what time period? It is a non-extendable three months that they're available for. So now for micro entity, that is going to be 75% off of most fees with the same exceptions as a small utility, right? So you have certificate of correction, document supply, and the miscellaneous charges. Um, as far as who qualifies for this one, that's going to be the poor making less than three times the median income for the previous year. So I think this year it was 150,000. They had to make less than 150,000. Um, hasn't applied or been named in more than four previous applications. And so those applications will not count if they were filed under the last place of employment. Um, if they are under obligation to assign to higher education. So um, if you paid for that in error, then and realize, you know, maybe the practitioner submitted a small entity payment and then realized that the inventor did in fact assign their application, then that can be fixed by repaying the difference between the current rates and the previous payments. Then for miscellaneous, these are just rules that um, you can pull out of MPAP 500 that I think are good to remember. Um, always keep the original copy of everything that is filed because, you know, you never know if it doesn't go through or um, if something happened on the PTO side. But don't submit that confirmation copy because the PTO, that will cause delay and um, that will not go over well with anyone there. 
Um, so emailing is possible if the applicant initiates. Um, once the application is given a filing date, that application is not available to public. It's under the same rules as other pending applications. Um, and so that filing receipt is issued when the fee or oath and declaration is submitted, i.e. when the application is complete. The notice of missing parts is accompanied by a notice of missing application when, um, you know, that filing fee, claims, drawings, or oath or declaration are not included. And then that notice of missing parts is accompanied by a notice of, um, or that, that we'll talk about more in MPEP 600. Um, and then applications not filed in English can also submit the translation later, but I believe that those do come with a fee. And that is about it. So thank you so much.